I'm Harriet Vance Ball, Associate Professor of Medicine and Cardiologist from McMaster University in Canada. And I'm absolutely delighted to have with me Professor Karthik from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And we are here at ESC 2022 to discuss his late breaking clinical trial presentation of the Invictus trial. Welcome, Karthik. Thank you. Thank you, Harriet. Pleasure meeting you here. Likewise, um, I'm going to start by asking you to give us some background so that our viewers can put Invictus in context of current knowledge about atrial fibrillation and rheumatic heart disease and anticoagulation regimens that have been evidence-based to date. And tell us what knowledge gap this trial fills. So, uh, this, uh, so as you know, uh, a rheumatic heart disease is a disease of poverty. It affects people mainly in uh, low and lower middle income countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the problem with uh, rheumatic heart disease as such is that uh, these are young people who develop AF much earlier than non valvular AF. They are at higher risk of stroke uh, much earlier in life. And when they develop strokes, they develop large strokes and it's pretty debilitating. And, uh, the subsequent burden and mortality is known to be high. So uh, the second part of the problem is that the classic trials of anticoagulation and atrial fibrillation explicitly excluded patients with rheumatic heart disease, particularly the ones with mild stenosis, because they felt at that point in time that these were patients who were at prohibitively high risk of stroke, and it was probably unethical to randomize these people. So as a result, you had the first trials of VKAs versus placebo in, from which RHT patients were systematically excluded. And then subsequently when the DOAC trials were compared, were done against VKAs, because these were non-inferiority trials, they again had to exclude patients with rheumatic heart disease. So as a consequence, you have zero RCTs for patients with rheumatic AF in terms of uh, stroke prevention. So this is a very big knowledge gap. And the, the third point is that as a result of all this, treatment of uh, patients with rheumatic AF is empirical and people give VKAs in developing countries. But the biggest challenge with using VKAs, as you all know, is the INR monitoring. And INR monitoring is very challenging in developing countries. And uh, data suggests that about just half the patients who are eligible for anticoagulation go on anticoagulation with VKAs, and even among those who are on anticoagulation, only about a third maintain an INR in the therapeutic range. So it's pretty dismal. And uh, so we, we felt that, you know, if we used an anticoagulant which does not need monitoring, and if we find that to be effective, this would be of great benefit to these patients. Um, so tell us about your trial design. Um, and how you tackled the question, your research question. So our research question was pretty simple. The question that we asked was, is rivaroxaban non-inferior to vitamin K antagonist dose adjusted uh, for, as originally planned, reduction of stroke or systemic embolism? Uh, we did this trial in about 24 countries, 138 centers around the world, all in the RHD endemic countries. So we have most of the patients coming from uh, Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, some other parts of Asia as well, including China, and then also Latin America. So we have about 24 countries participating, and we recruited about 4,500 patients. Uh, the, uh, the dose that we used was pretty straightforward, 20 milligram per uh, day of rivaroxaban uh, among patients with normal renal function. Anybody who had a calculated creatinine clear clearance less than 50, we used 15 mg dose. Mm -hmm. And we used, uh, for the purposes of VK, any locally approved VK in all these local, uh, in these participating countries. So most of it was uh, warfarin, and mm -hmm. uh, about 15% was uh, acinacumarol. Uh, so very standard, straightforward treatment. Mm -hmm. And we encouraged INR monitoring in uh, the patients who were on VK. And we tried to bring it up. You know, this was a non-inferiority trial, so we needed to maintain, make sure that the uh, control arm was treated well. Otherwise, it would have affected the integrity of our trial. So we did that with a simple al algorithm which suggested a 10% dose increase or decrease uh, 
uh, every month. So mm -hmm. that's that's how we went about it. And what were your inclusion and exclusion criteria? So so we included patients uh, who had echocardiographically proven rheumatic heart disease with documented atrial fibrillation or flutter. In addition, we required that because these patients are very young, we required that they needed to have at least one additional risk factor for stroke. Mm -hmm. So the two most important ones were the presence of moderate mitral stenosis, which, mm -hmm. is, which we defined as a mitral valve area less than or equal to two centimeters square, and, or a chat fast score of two or more. So these were the two primary inclusion criteria by which patients qualified to enter the trial. Of course, if they had left atrial thrombi or if they had spontaneous echocontrast, they could also enter the trial because they were considered at higher risk of stroke. So uh, these were the primary inclusion criteria. And uh, yeah, so our primary outcome, like I said, was initially stroke or systemic embolism. But then during the course of the study, we noted, you know, blinded to uh, the treatment allocation that our event rates were very, very low. The stroke mm -hmm. event rates were very low. Uh, and uh, uh, the deaths were far higher, about six to seven fold higher. So uh, uh, these were sick patients. Uh, the patients who were at risk of stroke were also dying. So we were unlikely ever to reach uh, our primary endpoint as we had originally planned. So mm -hmm. uh, blinded to the treatment allocation, treatment uh, arms, the steering committee decided at uh, a, somewhere in uh, 2020 to mm -hmm. expand the inclusion, uh, the outcomes to a larger composite, which included MI and deaths of vascular or unknown causes. So the final composite that we've analyzed and presented are, uh, is, is a composite of stroke systemic embolism, mitral, uh, myocardial infarction, or deaths due to vascular or unknown causes. This is quite similar to a previous uh, uh, trial, an old trial, uh, which was led from uh, PHRI McMaster. Uh, which was the active W trial. Mm -hmm. They used a similar composite uh, at that point of time. That was also a, a AF trial. So that's that's our modified uh, uh, composite out. Right, and important to mention, as you did, that you were blinded to treatment allocation when you um, had this change in protocol. Right. Um, tell us about the baseline characteristics. Yeah. So, so uh, in summary, there are. Uh, four or five important things that we need to remember when we look at the patients who were recruited into Invectus. First of all, they were young patients, average age of about 51. Mm -hmm. uh, this is about a decade and a half or two decades younger than the regular non-valvular AF mm -hmm. patients who have been included in these DOAC trials, for example. The second thing is this was a, uh, there was a female preponderance, about 70% of patients were female. And this is, this is very much in sync with what uh, the prevalence of RHD is mm -hmm. among females. Uh, so that is one thing which is very different from non valvular air. The third thing is 85% of patients had moderate mitral stenosis. And out of these patients, about two thirds had severe mitral stenosis as defined by mitral valve area less than 1.5 centimeters square. So these were patients predominantly with mitral stenosis. The, uh, the fourth important thing was that the conventional risk factors for stroke, atherosclerotic risk factors like hypertension, diabetes, or coronary artery disease was infrequent in this population. So as a consequence, you have about 45% of patients who have a chats vast score of either zero or one. So mm -hmm. uh, in terms of stroke risk, this is not conventional, by conventional metrics, this is not a high stroke risk population. Right. So, yeah. Okay. And what were your event rates in the control group? So uh, the stroke event rates, so overall the stroke event rates were about 1%. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, but the overall event rates for the primary composite is about 8.5%. Okay, So and what was the follow-up duration? So we had, we had about 4, 5, 3, 1 patients followed up for about an average of 3.1 years. Okay. We had excellent uh, uh, you know, completeness of follow-up. We had about 97% follow up remember that these are uh, this whole trial was done in very poor countries mm -hmm. where it was pretty challenging and we also had to go through the covid pandemic so despite that we achieved an excellent rate of follow up in these patients and uh, yeah so at the end of 3.1 average years of follow up uh, we are now uh, we have a ready to give the results risk. away yes. um, but before you do that uh, tell me about the INR achieved in the group that was on um, VKA therapy? Uh, so there are two aspects to it, right? So in the, uh, the, the study drug, uh, Rivaroxaban, the compliance rate for uh, Rivaroxaban 
rates of complete discontinuation, uh, permanent discontinuation at the end of trial was about 23%, which is in the ballpark for all the other DOAC trials. So there's nothing uh, uh, you know, alarming about that. So this is what is typical. Uh, on the other hand, patients on VKA had an excellent compliance. So typically in the DOAC trials, the rate of permanent discontinuation was similar in both arms. So about 20% of patients at two years typically go off the trial. But in Invictus, in the VKA arm, just 6% of patients were off the trial at the end of study. And at the end of three and a half, uh, three, 3.1 years of follow up So that is a pretty remarkable achievement. Uh, mm -hmm. For a trial done in developing countries, patients were on VKA. And why do you think there were these different rates of adherence to the drugs across groups? We don't know. Okay. Don't know, frankly, Not any don't. adverse effects or no. intolerance? One, one thing that could have contributed, it did contribute to a little bit of that, is that these were sick patients. They went on to have valve replacement surgeries with mechanical valves during the course of the study. So about a third of patients who discontinued Rivaroxaban permanently did so because they had to get mechanical valves. So, so that accounts for over. yeah. So they, that accounts for about a third of these patients. But the remaining patients, most of it was patient decision uh, why they stopped. Uh, and before we go on, I just need to also mention that uh, the INR control in mm -hmm. the uh, VKA arm at baseline was as expected about 30 percent, 33 percent. That is the proportion of INRs in range at baseline was about 33 percent. So which TTR. Is, mm -hmm. So we looked at the proportion of INRs in range. Okay. So that was about 33 percent, which was expected. That's usual practice, like I said in the beginning. But over the course of the study, by the end of two years, we had reached proportion of INRs in the range of 65 percent, and that was maintained throughout the study. And so this is in sync with all the DOAC trials which were done in high-income countries. So we did a good job with INR monitoring as well. Fantastic. And your um, analytic plan was intention to treat with yes. the primary analysis. Yeah. And so tell us what the results were. So, so at the end of 3.1 years of follow-up, the primary outcome occurred 25% more frequently in the river of Spana than in the BKA. So the hazard ratio was 1.25 with fairly tight confidence intervals and a very low p-value. So this was a very surprising result for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, for those of you who will read the paper in the New England, uh, so the curves, the Captain Mayer curves actually crossed over. Mm -hmm. So the proportional hazards assumption was not met. Mm -hmm. So as a result, we had to do a restricted mean survival time analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, the restricted mean survival time gives us the cumulative time uh, till the primary event uh, occurs. So, mm -hmm. so the difference in the restricted mean survival time is a, a good way to analyze when the curves cross over, when the proportion has its assumption is not met. So by all accounts, this was a statistically significant, uh, robust result. Mm -hmm. So there was a 25% increase in the risk of the primary outcome in patients on river oxaban when compared to those on BKA. And most of this, uh, uh, I, I would like to say it the other way. So VKA reduced the rate of the primary outcome among patients with rheumatic AF because the overall event rates were similar to uh, our previous experience with rheumatic heart disease patients in the ballpark of 8% 8, 8 per year. So that's, that's what we got. So, uh, and most of the difference in the primary outcome was driven by death. Yeah. And uh, in fact, the overwhelming proportion of of the primary outcome was death. So we had over nine, 990 uh, deaths in the study. And uh, that also showed a 25%, 23% increase uh, in the river of Spina. So uh, VKA is somehow protected against death. Fascinating and, as you say, unexpected very, results. Very, very unexpected. Did you do a sensitivity analysis uh, focusing on those patients that remained adherent to so we did, a, we did an uh, on, on treatment analysis, mm -hmm. which uh, looks at patients who yep. received at least one dose and uh, in the next five days. So we analyzed outcomes. So there was absolutely no difference. It was pretty much consistent. The results remained the same. It was a very robust result. Okay. Uh, and in terms of the stroke outcome, we had, as expected, fewer stroke events than we uh, had originally planned. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the ischemic stroke rates were lower with VKA mm -hmm. when compared to rivaroxaban. But overall, stroke or systemic embolism composite was not different between the two groups. And uh, there was no signal of safety at all. The, both the drugs were extremely safe. There were only about 90 odd uh, major bleeding events mm -hmm. in the entire study. So, and there was no statistically significant difference between the two groups. And I suspect that the rates of valve replacement were the same across groups? Yeah. Okay. So, so um, a large trial, uh, well executed, uh, primarily in low and middle income countries that bear the brunt of the burden of rheumatic heart disease. Tell us about the challenges of implementing a clinical trial in low resource settings and any particular challenges you had related to the COVID pandemic. Oh yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think here, uh, you know, PHRI is a very experienced uh, group of people who have done uh, these trials in low and middle countries for a long time now. So uh, they have all the resources and they have the experience and they've done these trials for maybe more than 20 years. Now. So uh, that's the biggest advantage that we had uh, in terms of uh, experienced people like Dr. Yusuf and uh, Stuart Conley and others uh, at the PHRI. So uh, that's number one. And the second thing is we had great national leaders across the world, people who were really interested in uh, rheumatic heart disease and who uh, went out of their way to sometimes recruit patients, follow up patients, because you know some of these countries uh, had local uh, strife and mm -hmm. things like that, and they, they were able to recruit and follow up patients. Mm -hmm. And COVID didn't help at all. I'm really glad that we've had a chance to discuss this trial. Uh, it's been a I, pleasure. I hope our paths cross again, and I will um, come to your presentation uh, this week at ESC. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. Thank you.